welcome to this accessing land with the uh, ecological land cooperative um it's great to see you all again um we have got we've got the a, a, a long section at the end of this um session for um a q a so we're going to run that through the chat box so uh we're gonna we're gonna answer all questions at the end but throughout the session if anything comes up please do post your questions straight in the chat box um kathy will be keeping an eye and then when we get to our q a se session at the end of at the end of this session then um kathy will field those questions to um our panelists our elc team um so there we go if you could as I mentioned before, hopefully everyone heard, keep, stay on mute and put all questions in the chat box, that'd be perfect. Nice one. So as I said, we've got a, we've got a few presentations from various team members, first of all. Uh, then we'll show a short video, um, which shows some of the stuff that we get up, get up to as DLC and um, a few of the farms um, who have been around for varying levels of lengths of time. So there'll be a presentation, then the video, and then following that, we will have um a, a lengthy chance for some q a hopefully so uh i'm just gonna get the team to introduce themselves quickly and then we'll get into it so ollie would you like to go first uh, hello morning everybody i'm ollie rodka i'm a director one of the directors of ecological land cooperative uh, which basically means i'm one of the people elected by the membership to sit on the board and i'm also a part-time staff member uh, who's responsible for our site monitoring and it's over to sonia Hi everyone, I'm Sonia Selenan. I'm the coordinator, formerly the operations manager at uh, the Ecological Land Cooperative. And I um, essentially do that, coordinate the work of the, the, the ever-growing team um, here at the ERC. Um, and I'll hand over to Oliver. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Oliver Bettany. Um, my job title at ELC is Information Systems Manager which is a, a fairly back office role, um, supporting the IT and digital needs of the organization. But I'm also currently coordinating the steward selection process. So um, if following this session, you decide that you wanna make a, an application for one of our plots, then you will be um, in, initially in contact with me. And uh, we'll say a bit more about that later uh, on in the session. So I'm gonna hand over to Stella now to introduce yourself, introduce herself. Thanks, Oliver. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see some familiar faces, um, names. I'm Stella. I am the Site Development Manager here at the ELC. Over to Cathy. Hi, I'm Cathy Yexley. I'm uh, a staff member at ELC and I'm the fundraiser. And I'm going to hand over to Lucy. Hi everyone, I'm the uh, communications manager at the ELC, so I manage social media and press and things like that. Um, yeah, I'm going to be monitoring the chat box um, and I'm going to hand over to Dylan. Can we talk to Dylan? Great. No, yeah. I'm, uh, thanks, Lucy. I'm the finance and admin manager um, at the ELC. Um, been here for almost a year and it's been a great year, great team to be part of. Um, Great, thanks everyone. So we're going to get cracking with the presentation now and we'll start with Ollie for a bit of uh, context and history. Um, yeah, my, I think we, we wanted to start just with a bit of context really, which I'm sure people are generally aware of, otherwise they probably wouldn't be here at ORFC, but the context that we're working in is, uh, you know, a climate emergency, a food system that is well off the rails in terms of health, access to food, food poverty, um, healthy food being accessible to people, most of the land still being managed here in the UK under a, a model that maximises production at the expense of other things. And although we probably all know of some brilliant projects now that are going on, and there is a real transition happening, I think, still, I think we have to admit that the majority of land in the UK is still managed under that productionist model um we don't have a good uh, we don't have any coherent land use strategy in the uk to try and rectify a series of problems we have a land use pattern that is a uh, out of kilter with biodiversity with climate issues uh, we need to integrate food production into biodiversity into ecology into a local food economy that benefits people nature uh, and the climate uh, next slide 
And so what we've been trying to do over the last um, nearly nearly 15 years, really, since we first started talking about this, and I get to do this intro because I've been around so long now, um, is, is trying to develop a model that addresses sort of all those multiple issues in one go. So um, we, we're a model that establishes small farms um, to the benefit, sort of aiming for new entrants and people coming into farming, aiming to be part of the local food economy to help regenerate rural communities and some of the social issues that we have to give a space for wildlife and biodiversity that can sequester carbon um, and prove that uh, a sustainable low impact lifestyle is possible. Um, so sort of multiple benefits across those five areas. Um, and our, our sort of small farm, small scale ecological farming model um, can, can do all of these things together. And so that's why we believe so passionately in it. And um, you know, now after a few years, we are actually, I think, beginning to see real progress. It's been slow with a new enterprise starting up, but we're really picking up speed now, and that's great. Um, lots of people accept the urgency of these issues, the serious nature of them. Um, and I think it's a it's a job, it's a role for all of us to, to work out how we can help make that shift, how we can be part of that process to change things. Hopefully our model, um, and we will believe it is, uh, our small farm model is an important lever to help us make that transition. And uh, the vision slide, which is next. Uh, which I can't remember off the top of my head, so I will need to see it <laughs> from our sort of guiding documents. Um, I'll just read it out. We want to see a living, working countryside where land is accessible and affordable for those who want a land-based livelihood. And we want to see farm businesses that use natural inputs to grow good, healthy local food and produce that benefits people, communities and the natural environment long into the future. And I'm going to hand over here to Sonia, who's going to take her over the next few slides. We're, we're sort of splitting up to the different parts of this slideshow. So you'll be hearing from a few of us over the few different subjects that the slides cover. So over to you, Sonia. Thanks. Thanks, Ollie. And thanks for getting us started 15 years ago with all the other fabulous um, founders of the ELC. Um, I'm going to talk about our mission now. Um, Ollie's just um, encapsulated our vision, and um, and in order to sort to achieve that, um, we have a mission, and um, and the first part of that is that the the ELC creates clusters of residential, ecologically managed small scale farms, and we try to do that in a way that is affordable um, and that promotes the values of being low impact and cooperative. Um, and we do this to demonstrate um, that low grade agricultural land can be improved using organic principles that support um, the production of good healthy local food and also work to, in, um, to create greater biodiversity on land that has often been depleted in, uh, through industrial agricultural processes. Um, the land that we own is protected um, by uh, a clause in our rules that um, so that it so that it can't be sold out of um, agroecological use, um, and we're growing the ELC. Our mission is to grow the ELC so that we can become self-sustaining and our farms can be self-sustaining for future generations. And as as Ollie said in our mission that we want to do this, we want this to be something that carries on long into the future. Um, part of what we do is undertake research and. Um, we want to provide evidence of the benefits of low impact ecological agriculture, both for local communities and for the natural environment, uh, for people and the natural and the natural environment. Um, and we also undertake um, research into areas um, around what we're doing to, to uh, directly tackle specific er issues of um, diver improving diversity um, in farming and in agroecology as well. Um, and we campaign for policy change um, at different levels of um, the system that encourage low impact development to encourage low impact developments for sustainable food production, for land stewardship, and for rural and land based livelihoods. Next slide. Sorry, there's a lot of words on these slides, but I'm going to get through them. Um, obviously, 
we should say this session is being recorded and if you don't get all of it, we can also make the slides available if it's, if it's helpful to you. Um, so the way that we, we do this, our model is to raise capital through ethical investment. And we, we run, we're, a, we're a community benefit society and we run community share offers and have at the moment over 400 investors who've put their money into the organisation very patiently, allowing us to invest in the um, development of our small farms. Um, we purchase suitable land and there's a lot of parameters around that, which I know um, Stella will be talking about a bit later on. Um, we design a cluster of residential small farms. We obtain planning permission. And again, that's a long process and often very difficult and navigating a, a complicated system. And unfortunately, our planning manager, Ruth, is not here today to go into a lot of detail there. But there's a lot of information on our website and um, uh, for, you know, you can always talk to us if you want to find out more about that process. Once we've obtained planning permission, we create, um, we will, we, 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 we put an amount of um, development infrastructure onto the site, so we, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, we pass on only the costs of um, developing the site rather than any uplift gain from achieving planning permission. So the idea is that we maintain affordability of our sites um, and we're not charging a market rate um, for the small farms. Um, we seek grant funding for infrastructure to keep our costs down. Um, and then um, as, as Oliver mentioned, he, we recruit new entrant ecological farmers. Um, to go on site, we create an ecological management plan for the farm on each site and we monitor those farms for compliance to our management plans. Next slide, please, Oliver. So what we offer um, is a supportive framework for entrant farmers to establish their businesses. And that can include any of the following things or, and all of them, and maybe even more, but, um, so we were offering an initial temporary planning permission to live on the farm. And after five years, we apply for permanent planning permission to build a low impact dwelling. Um, and we have achieved success on one of our sites so that we have one site with permanent permission uh, for three farms. Um, we build a shared timber frame barn. Um, we put in uh, a highway authority compliant access track. Um, on the barn, we were putting solar panels for renewable electricity generation and, um, and also uh, tanks for rainwater harvesting. Um, and then to support our farmers, we can offer regular volunteering days um, for tree planting and for assistance with, their, with setting up their farms. Um, we can offer ongoing support and advice regarding business planning and we help with grant applications and additional planning um, conditions and permissions for um, further kind of developments on the, on the farms, um, such as polytunnels or maybe extra buildings. Um, we also offer opportunities for mutual support and collaboration through the cluster model where we have um, three farms on one site, but also through the wider um, support of um, other farms on other sites and our cooperative members. And we also offer the opportunity to have mentoring and business business support for the farms um, with expert partners. Oh, and I can slow down and just show you a picture of our barn. Um, this is a picture of the barn that we built on our site in Arlington in East Sussex. So you can see that it's a, it's a large barn with space for um, three farms to um, store their stuff and also the, the solar panels and the water tank. That was the end of my part of the session and I'm going to just run through Ruth's as well. So apologies if this is a bit of a swift um, go over our planning policy requirements. And as I said, we can talk about that more outside of this meeting or, or later on. Um, so the national planning policy framework states that planning policies and decisions should avoid the development of isolated homes in the countryside unless one or more of the following circumstances apply. Um, and that is that there's an essential need for a rural worker, including those taking majority control of a farm business, to live permanently at or near their place of work in the countryside. And that's the, 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 the clause that we're using um, to apply for rural workers' dwellings on our, um, on our small farm sites. 
And, um, and it says here that specific criteria vary between local or different planning um, authorities and we're looking at local, we're having to work to their own local plans and each authority will have its own take on, on what they're prepared to accept in terms of um, citing rural workers dwellings and we navigate that by understanding those um, local policies as well as um, as well as fitting into the national planning policy frame framework. Um, the, there's two key um, factors that must apply to any of our farm businesses um, and that is that there must be a functional need um, for the farmer to live for the farmer and farmers to live on their land and those factors might include that there are long working hours and that there needs to be a quick response time um, that there are uh, many things happening there's a multifaceted nature to the to the farm business um, that there needs to be someone on site because um, the farm the pest control system is manual we don't um, you know we're not using chemicals or or um, other inputs to um, control pests um, for frost protection and the need to be very much on top of the temperatures in polytunnels and um, around uh, you know, specific uh, crops. Um, low impact watering methods and, and, and other requirements relating to animal husbandry if you're for stock people keeping stock. Um, and the other, the other very important part is the financial viability of the farm business. And we do this by, um, so we have to demonstrate or our farmers have to demonstrate that their businesses are um, robust and that they will become um, self-sustaining over time. And we do this by pro pro providing the local authority with a, um, a business plan, uh, a five-year business plan for the, the, the new farm businesses with robust financial protection projections, um, clear um, intention and also, um, you know, demonstrated ability of the, the new entrant farmers. Um, and we, we work with the local authority to assess those new farms business plans so that um, they can see that there's a clear um, intent to create a sustainable farm business on the site. I'm handing over now to Oliver. Thank you, Sonia. So I have a couple of slides here to um, explain to those of you in the uh, session who are, might be considering making an application, uh, what the process is. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly lengthy process um, because we aim to provide um, a lot of support in that process to um, help people develop their, their business plans through the process. Um, and really, we're trying to provide guidance and support um, for potential stewards, no matter where they are on their journey to become agroecological farmers. So we get a lot of applications or a lot of interest from people that are fairly early on in their journey. And we uh, are able to offer some guidance to those people. So um, that is to say that, you know, if you are interested in, um, in making an application now or in the future, then, yeah, please get in touch because we may be able to give you some tips on 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 where to go uh, next, even if you're not quite ready to, to make an application. Um, the model isn't for everyone, um, and the process is designed to help applicants decide for themselves if it's right for them or not. And um, that process can take some time um, because it's a um, it's a huge commitment to to the organisation as it to the co-op um, to to to, to, to to set up a, a farm and um yeah there's a that there are various phases of kind of learning through that process which means that sometimes applicants will decide um to not pursue things but um it does mean that there's a lot of learning in the process which is of value to to, to applicants and to and to the organization um process can take, take a while up to a year or longer um and this is because um uh, it's variable depending on the experience of applicants and the availability of sites um, and the length of the planning process, which is which can take um, uh, any, any, anywhere from a year to two years um, to go through the, the full process. And uh, often it's um, unclear as to how long that process will take. There'll be um, various um, steps in that process. Um, and it's, yeah, as I say, it's difficult to, 
to, to, to know in advance how long that process may take sometimes. Um, suitability of applicants um, is broadly determined by, by five factors. Um, agriculture experience, business experience, low impact living experience, um, experience of working and living cooperatively, and the availability of finance. Our, our rent to buy model, which is the one that um, uh, applicants tend to go for, requires uh, a 20% down payment on, on a lease at the start of the, the lease period, um, which is a figure between 20 to 25,000 uh, pounds deposit, which is um, uh, required for the rent to buy model. Um, there is a requirement also for you know a significant chunk of startup capital um, to site your um, home and to um, provide the additional infrastructure for your business that um, that ELC won't provide things like polytunnels and and other things. So yeah, but just to bear in mind that um, some savings uh, um, there is you know there's a there is a, there is an investment needed, even though it's uh, relative to the cost of buying a. A farm that's already set up it's relatively small um, first stage of the application process is to read the information on our website and um, the second stage is to contact me uh, via email to express your interest and tell us a little bit about your experience your background and the business ideas and uh, we'll be sharing my email address in the in the chat um, either now or at the end of the end of the session um, once um, you've made contact, we'll book in a half an hour conversation and we'll chat through a few various things, answer any questions that you have um, at that stage. And hopefully by the end of that call, we'll have a sense of whether or not, um, you know, we would, we would like, welcome an application at this stage or whether or not it, needs, it might be a little bit further down the line. Um, certainly enough information for you to kind of go away and have a good think about whether or not you want to make an application and we provide various resources um, to support that process, um, including um, some example business plans and uh, other information about the specific site that you would be interesting to, interested to apply for. Um, very important to visit the, the sites that you're interested in um, at this early stage, just to get a sense of the, the lay of the land. Um, obviously that is something that can make a big difference um, in terms of kind of spending time on the land and getting a feel for um, a location. So we ask applicants to do that at an early stage. Um, there's an application form and the first draft business plan for a specific site that we require. Um, once we've received that, we review those and provided some initial feedback and guidance based on uh, our experience of, of seeing these early, early draft business plans. And if you think it's sufficiently developed, we'll invite you for an initial interview, um, which is an opportunity to meet the team, um, a few more members of the team. Usually it's a Zoom interview and uh, takes about an hour and a half. And then again, another opportunity for us to ask you some questions and for you to ask us some questions. Um, following this interview, if you think your plan is, is sufficiently developed, then we'll invite you into the second stage of the application process, which is unique, uniquely tailored for individual applicants. Um, and there's a variety of steps in this process which um, uh, applicants are asked to, um, to get involved in, depending on, on various factors, um, including whether or not um, some uh, you know, additional farm scale experience might be needed uh, in areas of the business, business plan that you're focusing on. Um, we'll ask you to produce a second draft of your business plan based on um, you know, the, the, the feedback process. Um, there'll be an opportunity to attend a, attend a second interview where we'll explore the business plan and your financial forecasts in more detail be able to spend a week or so volunteering um, and at one of our farms um, and there's a kind of a process there where you can yeah uh, time to ask all the questions you want to ask of our farm stewards and um, yeah to get a feel for what it might be like to be uh, living and working on an ELC farm. Um, there's also um, an opportunity potentially to meet other stewards who'll be farming the same site as you to kind of, kind of get a feel for who your neighbours might be and once the steps are complete, 
uh, and we feel or we all feel that um, it's the it's um, the right thing for uh, a plot to be offered, then we'll offer you a, make a provisional offer of a lease, and this offer will be conditional on a few factors, um, including us successfully achieving planning permission for the site that you're applying for. In some cases, um, we may have already achieved temporary planning, in which case things might move quite quickly from that point. But, um, but often we'll still be in the planning process um, and there'll be a waiting period when we're waiting for the temporary planning permission to be um, to be achieved. Uh, and once we've once we've achieved that, um, there is potentially um, a requirement for the planning authority to approve the business plan. And there is a requirement for um, for um, new uh, leaseholders to, to agree to our management plan and to the conditions of the lease of course and when these steps have been completed and all the site infrastructure the barn and the solar system etc have all been completed we'll sign um, a 150 year lease with you and you'll pay a 20 percent deposit and then you'll be in a position to move on to the site so that's um, the uh, uh, application process in brief i'm going to now hand over to stella to just share with you some information about um, some of our existing sites and some of the opportunities um, for, for, at those sites. Thanks, Oliver. Um, so apologies to anyone that was here last year because there might be some uh, repetition because obviously our sites are the same largely. Um, so this is our first uh, site here, Green and Reach in Mid Devon. Um, as Sonia said earlier, they now have planning permission for three residential farms, um, which was granted in 2019. And you can see the relative, uh, all of the businesses listed there that are currently operating on the site. And site two is uh, Arlington, um, apologies, Martins Field in Arlington, which um, now is full as well. There are three sets of stewards on the land there. Currently, um, that is uh, temporary planning permission. So they're still within their first five years of operating. Um, this is quite an old picture, actually. It's, um, it's grown up a fair bit since then. Um, but yeah, as I say, three sets of stewards and some new arrivals on the way as well um, in child form, not in farmer form. Uh, so site three, please, Oliver is Furs Hill on the Gower, um, which uh, currently has two sets of stewards operating on it, um, quite well known CSA, K Tan, and, and then the Rowan Tree are also there. Um, there are currently people, I think, speaking to Oliver for the last plot, but we are still accepting um, interested parties to definitely, definitely come and talk to us if you would like to steward in Wales. Um, they are, our open applications at the moment. Um, on to site four, which we, I think at last year's ORFC, thought we were gonna get a positive um, planning permission decision on. And unfortunately, we're still waiting for that decision, although um, it's pretty positive at the minute and hopefully will be any moment now. Um, which, uh, yeah, cider apple trees who were farming there at the moment would be very, very pleased to hear because they're currently homeless. So if anyone from the planning department's listening, please hurry that up. Um, and also we are accepting applications for, for these, uh, the remaining plots, remaining plot. Please contact Oliver if you'd like to apply and he'll let you know um, the details of what remains there. And site five, is, currently there are no stewards um, on this site. Um, we have a, an application in for the temporary plan permission, um, which again, we're really hoping for a positive decision quite soon. Um, and there have been lots of positive noises um, about getting that. So this one may actually strangely overtake um, the Sparkford site uh, because it just seems to have more traction for various reasons, which is unfortunate Ruth can't be with us today um, because she's the, the lead on all of the planning stuff. It's very interesting um, to see what she does there. And um, so the big bit of news that we'll be sort of um, uh, 
announcing more officially, hopefully in the coming weeks, is we have what will become site six um, now in our possession or very, very soon to have. Um, my school in Istaf in Wales has been donated to us incredibly. It's a, a 60 acre farm um, in Carmarthenshire. And so, yeah, in, it's been left to us in the will of Jen and Stuart Carter. Um, so huge, enormous, enormous thanks to them for this absolutely astonishing gift of, of their farm. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a bit bowled over by this because I, I have I barely um, let myself dream that it would be the case. So apologies for my terrible Welsh pronunciation of the farm name. I can't wait to hear a native speaker say it. Um, and so that's, that's our big news, which we'll be um, announcing more officially. I think that's, this is the first time anyone said that in public. So it's, it's very, very incredibly exciting. Uh, yes, my screen is F. And this is um, Stuart's beautiful hand-drawn map. Of, of the farm. Um, so yeah, just enormous, enormous gratitude to them for this incredible gift. And well done everyone that's been working tirelessly, not tirelessly, but for years talking to Jen and Stuart, um, who unfortunately both are now no, no longer with us, but they have left us this, this gift in, the, in ELC's care. So um, we're always looking for more land and more opportunities for new entrants. Um, so this is just a list of our criteria of, um, at which we will purchase land. Um, donations are a very different matter. So if, if you have land to donate, please completely ignore this list and get in touch with us. Um, but we're particularly interested also in private sales of land. Um, and this is a, I'll just give you a very quick run through of what we would hope. Um, our land purchases would be. So between uh, five and 40 acres, the total price under around 375,000. So if the land is priced at more than 10,000 per acre, it would need to have um, some very favorable other criteria to go with it. Um, for our stewards, we hope that it will be reasonable grade, cultivatable land and below 250 meters above sea level. Uh, ideally, it would be flat or with a southern aspect, southeast, southwest is fine, but we would need some of, or all of it to be level enough um, to build on and allow market garden type enterprises, uh, ideally with no uh, steep slopes. Uh, good water connection, good in inverted commas, so either a mains connection um, at or near the site or a strong groundwater source. We would need direct vehicle access off the road and it should be situated where our development would not seriously affect the visual immunity of others. Um, and ideally with no uh, covenants on the land, overage, clawback, uplift provision attached. Um, and as I said earlier with the donation side of things, equally with a sale, if, if a piece of land uh, doesn't meet all these criteria, but is, but is excellent, um, we would still be interested in talking to you about it. Uh, yeah, the Carmarthenshire gift is amazing. I'm just seeing from her that it's yeah, amazing. Um, so yeah, please do get in touch, uh, particularly with donations, private sales. Uh, we need to blow up what we're doing and have way, way more small farms um, feeding us and, uh, and all the other positive benefits that uh, the ELC stewards bring when they steward a piece of our land. Um, thanks, I think that's the end of me. I'm not certainly who I'm passing on to. We go to the next slide and we'll know. Ah, Ollie. You're passing on to me. Um, we go round again, back to the beginning. Um, I'm just doing the last couple of slides about our monitoring process. So um, as has been laid out by others, there's a sort of process about people beginning and the temporary permission. And then um, one, of the, one of the ways that one of our levers, I guess, in, in talking to planning authorities and the reason that we say that we are a dependable organisation is because we have a monitoring process to make sure that what we say at the beginning of the process is adhered to. And um, we do that through um, a management plan, which is monitored every year. So someone will go and uh, check basically that that things are in line with the management plan and um, uh, we we'll, can can sort of talk about any any issues that are coming up. Um, the, the management plan can be quite 
a longish document because it's got to cover a lot of different things but um, here's some of the the basics um, there's got to be somebody who is um, or, or they've got to be an equivalent amount of people such that there's one full-time person working on the land because this is all about an agricultural permission there has to be an agricultural business there has to be someone working there um, it's not for people to live in and then commute off to the city um, can't be subletting there's got to be ecological management care of any existing valuable habitats um, renewable energy generation a reversible low impact building um, policy and um, there's also a limitation on the amount that the lease can be resold for so if for whatever reason people do decide that they need or want to move on they can um, resell the lease back to ELC or to someone else uh, directly with ELC's agreement uh, but there's a, a cap on that a limitation on the amount of value that can be gained which which does include their improvements and the cost of their improvements but doesn't allow them to get a market value and that's the way that we retain affordability and can fulfill some of our social um, sort of regeneration and and affordability parameters um next slide and uh yeah, we, we say in our application for these farms that we will report annually to local planning authorities, which we do. We send them um, our audits. I can't say we've ever had a lot of feedback from the planning authorities, and I'm not certain who looks at them. Um, but we do that, and I think it's important that we do that because it's important that there's a record there and that we show that we mean what we say and that we're fulfilling our obligations. Um, so, you know, yeah, broadly, we, we cover environmental, social and economic issues um, around there being being a working farm regarding looking after the ecology of the site regarding um, the sort of social impacts and people are a sort of valuable, valued or reasonable part of the local community um, and are, yeah, making a positive contribution, basically. Um, and there, again, there's some things there pointed out, state of the soils, the amount of traffic generated, energy and water use, waste, et cetera. Visual impact, obviously there's, you know, we wouldn't be happy if someone built a seven story concrete skyscraper, have to be some limitations because what we're doing is about ecology and talking about people living in harmony with the natural environment. So that's a monitoring process that goes on through the existence of people's leases. Um, there's a team of people that will go out and and just meet people and while everything's fine then it's a fairly um low uh, low uh, low admin low time exercise if there are questions or problems and obviously there's a whole process to to look into that and see what's going on um i think that's i think that's it is it what is the next slide is that the last slide but i can't see the slides coming up so uh <laughs> i wait to see there we go right. it's ended <laughs> Uh, thanks so much ollie and stella and oliver and sonia thank you for all that um please do keep those questions coming in thank you to all who are contributing whether they're specific or more general um then please do get them in we're just gonna now show a, a short video a short five minute video about some of the work of the elc um and following that uh we'll hand over to kathy to run run through the q a session so Sonia, are we good to go on the video? I will, I will also post a link to the video in the chat box yeah, on YouTube. Great. So if there's any problems with viewing it, you can follow this link to YouTube. Brilliant, thank you. Morning, everyone. Welcome to what was named Martinsfield by the Ecological Land Cooperative. I'm Chris and Emily, my wife is over there. We run Fanfield Farm, which is the slice of heaven in that corner. Sinead and Adam, they run Orside Farm. And then there's another farm to be filled over in this corner. You can see today that we're doing some tree planting. There's lots of people around. So we decided during 2020, we wanted to plant 2020 trees. Our principles around growing are more trees, more flowers and healthy soil. So the first thing to work on is the more trees. We focus on a lot of like edible flowers, cut flowers, and kind of thinking about food a little bit differently. We've got quite a few things to crack on with this year. I think we live in times that are showing just 
how important it is to be an agroecological farmer. It's really moving us towards a place where we understand the impact that what we've been doing for the last sort of 30 years has on the environment. Agroecology is important because we win across different areas. Dealing with the climate crisis that we've got right in front of us now is really urgent. Helping biodiversity and nature and producing healthy food and healthy materials for people. We wanted to run a veg box scheme and I wasn't happy doing that on land that I knew could end in, in six months to 12 months because I could just let a lot of people down. So we decided to look for an active piece of land that we could regenerate the soil, put a lot of work into the ecosystem of it, but also would be here for a long period of time, our, our future home if you like. Someone had just mentioned the ecological land cooperative. We went in thinking this is far too good to be true. This can't be people that are setting something up that's genuinely for good and, and that aligns with our sort of goals. And six months later we're here and, and it, yeah, I still have to pinch myself every day. The central objectives of the ALC are to purchase marginal agricultural land and to get planning permission in order for our steward farmers to live and work on the land that they own. We also are very committed to developing regenerative farming techniques. We have always dreamed of doing something like this, but we had it in a 10-year, 15-year plan rather than a now plan. <laughs> We've managed to plant over a thousand trees today. We're planning to extend the lake here and have it as a real like nature reserve type space. I think we've had about 50 people today and all coming together to plant trees and improve like the habitat space on this field is amazing. I live in the next village, so I was really sort of keen to get down and show some support. Quite excited to have this on, on the doorstep. Oh, creamy. Yeah, come on, I need to put a plastic sheath on this one. This is where you'll be able to buy your fruit and veg grown in the field next to your house. It doesn't get better than that. The Ecological Land Cooperative is answering, for me, two main issues. One is the fact that it is so difficult for new entrants to get onto land, and we're answering that by providing affordable starter holdings. And the other side of it is, we have to do farming differently. We know that we've depleted the soils, that we have lost soil carbon, that we have water pollution, air pollution problems. And there's a growing body of people that have got great ideas, agroecology, agroforestry, permaculture. And by providing affordable starter farms, those can be trialled and we can see something wonderful happening. I think some of the big challenges that we found is, you know, we're city people, like we have no idea, like where do you start looking for land? And the ELC have been great for us because they were an organisation that helped us do that. Like a lot of those kind of logistical things around planning and yeah, they've just made the whole process a lot easier. The challenge is that there isn't access to land. When you look at the costs involved, they're just enough to put you off. A lot of talks that we went to, it originated from a you inherit land and it kind of feels like you only do it if you're born into it whereas DLC provided a platform for people like us to be given a chance to go and do this. structure that they offered allowed us to be able to afford it to move here to start with and they supported the planning process so it seemed a lot more of a secure option for a family with children to commit to. So this is violet willow which is Salix daphnoides and we harvest the bark and then we dry that and put it either in tea mixes, tincture it or make it into powder to put into capsules for rheumatic achy conditions, things like that. What's different about the ERC is that we make sure that land stays in agricultural use and ecological use in perpetuity. So although we give the stewards really long leases, 150 years, so they can really build up their farm business, we also make sure we keep hold of the freehold so that the land isn't then just sold out of farming and ecological use. 
We moved here in April 2015 and then last year in 2019 the great news came through from Mid Devon District Council that we have secured permanent permission. We are allowed to live here permanently as long as we're running our agricultural business and we have the right to build a permanent home. We are seeing the trees growing taller than me now which is really exciting and we've just got lots to look forward to. Gaining that permanent permission last year is the good feeling of living here when you wake up every day is brilliant. It's really humbling to like have this responsibility, I guess. Regeneration is something that's really important to us in trying to fix the things that are broken. And to be able to do that and you know see it coming together now with these trees going in is makes you feel quite teary. <laughs> yeah. Dylan. Perfect. Thanks, Sonia. That's brilliant. Well, actually, I'm going to hand straight over to Kathy um, after a sip of tea. And then maybe, Kathy, you can go back through some of the questions we've had in the chat box and we'll hopefully get some answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to kind of go through them as they came in. Um, and also, if they um, keep, keep questions coming because we've got a good chunk of time um, for you to ask us questions. So uh, yes, please keep um, posting them in the chat box. So the first question we had um, as we were going through the slides um, that I don't think has been answered by um, our presentation was from Richard and he wanted to know if the ELC offered any services to um, those who were interested in regenerative and uh, agroecological practices that maybe weren't um, uh, weren't going to apply to be um, stewards of ELC land. So it's more, do we offer kind of general advice? So I thought I would direct that question to Ollie in the first instance. Um, I guess the short answer is no, really. We haven't done a great deal of that and it's not really part of our, our our core work. Our, our core work is taking land and establishing new farms on it. I mean, where it was maybe near to one of our existing sites, or there was sort of a way of there being some synergy with our existing sites and work, then it's certainly possible. I mean, and I think generally speaking, we'd all be, we'd all want to help anybody who's, who's looking at these issues and trying to transition their business or their, their land. Um, so I wouldn't want to be too, um, wouldn't want to sort of brush off an inquiry but I guess it's um it would be fair to say that that's that's not really our the central part of our work but if you had a specific question you could maybe um email us there's an there's an info at ecological land address and uh, email address and we can see if there's we could direct you um or or help in some other way there is currently if you're looking at generally just transitioning to agroecology there's currently um a scheme being run by the Land Works Alliance if you, as long as you have an SBI number, an agricultural business number, you can um, join that and get and get some free time, two or three, two or more days of mentoring and advice from uh, from experts and professionals around your particular farm. And I, I would also just say more generally um, that uh, the ELC website does have quite a lot of uh, useful information about. Um, agroecological practices as well so you could find information there as your first port of call. Um, so another question this one is from uh, Kirsten and um, they ask uh, beside growing would ELC be interested in running a field kitchen for the cluster and community offering a small menu of seasonal dishes using ingredients from uh, the cluster farms would you consider something like this? And I thought maybe um, this might be something Oliver might be able to answer, but step in if somebody else could. Yeah, I'm happy to answer this question. So the, the short answer is, is yes. If um, you have a diverse um, agroecological farm business, which is um, focused on growing good, healthy food on the land, and you are um, 
processing that food in some way to um, and, and also providing um, a community service, um, particularly um, within a kind of a farm cluster, a, co a cooperative scheme like the one that you've that you've suggested there. I think that's something that we would broad, broadly support. Um, and in fact, we have had applications from um, from people in the past who have had, who have similar kinds of ideas. So it's something that we come we hear quite a lot. And um, yeah, we we broadly support um, as long as there is um, you know a, a, a sufficient amount of of food growing or um, farming happening, as well as that, you know, the focus is 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 generally uh, needing to be on 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 the farming side of things and um, other other ways of of processing the the, um, the stuff that gets grown there as a as a kind of a, a side business. Thanks. Thanks, Oliver. Um, another question that I'm going to direct to you, Oliver, is um, um, you did touch on this in your presentation, but perhaps you could go into a little bit more detail about this, is um, how ELC offers support to um, the applicants on um, developing their business plans. This one's from Luke. OK, thanks for the question, Luke. So, um, at, the, at an early stage in the application process, um, when we have an initial telephone call, uh, on the basis of that telephone call, uh, we invite applications. Um, and at that stage, we have more capacity to support people that are that are putting together an application and a, and a business plan. So some applicants have some level of confidence and experience putting together a business plan that others don't. So what we initially provide is an application pack that contains a really solid um, example business plan, which has been approved um, by, um, it's been kind of anonymized, um, but um, the original version of which has been, has been used in our planning applications. So that's a really excellent resource. Um, and there is a, um, a process in that early stage where we provide uh, some initial feedback on, on that first draft business plan. Um, and, um, and then following that, um, once we've been through the initial interview process and we're in the, se sec the second stage of the application process, if you like, then again, there's more support which around um, developing um, uh, more specific sort of financial forecasts and sort of general help really with um, putting together a final draft of the business plan that that sort of passes muster with the planning authorities and that we feel is is, is sufficiently detailed um, uh, and um, sufficiently mature to to, to 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 be ready to to be put into action on one of our sites it's probably worth is worth saying though that we you know are still a relatively small organization we have sort of limits to our capacity and anyone who um is making an application would would do well to to, to seek additional support in developing their business plan from friends family anyone really that's in their kind of circle that might have some experience in 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 the, the kind of the more business side of things um, uh, because that's always useful Thank you. Um, a question here from Emma. Um, they would like to know how ELC supports the three farms to work together effectively and make decisions together. So this is about um, how we ensure and promote cooperative working and governance, governance on our sites. And I wondered whether maybe Sonia would like to answer that question and or possibly Oliver. Want me to have a go, Oliver? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, it's a good question, and some it's something that we've kind of realised as as we've developed as an organisation requires quite a lot of input actually. Um, and um, as we've got a kind of growing staff team, and we have recruited, we sort of created a position of community support. Um, sort of steward support, we call it steward support and community development manager. Um, and we're actually recruiting to that post right now, and the closing date is Sunday of this weekend. So anybody interested in that role, do take a look at our website. Maybe Lucy, if she's got the moment, could put the link up to that. Um, 
but um, yeah, so it's something that we put resource into, um, and it, but it, it were quite it was still quite nascent in our actual sort of development because we we haven't been we we complicatedly had someone in the role and they're not there anymore unfortunately, and so we've faltered a little bit. But what we know is that we need to actually be there physically when, when it's possible, and sometimes you know as we know over the previous few years not physically but electronically to support our stewards to kind of get to know each other because when they're going on site um for the you know when everyone's arriving they don't know it necessarily know each other in advance but also creating a system for them to communicate through so like having sort of regular meetings on site identifying the priorities for themselves usually around um, the sharing of the communal resources um their own uh relationships with the wider community locally and also um, some uh, at least sort of dialogue about what they're going to be doing with their farm businesses and that how they complement each other and how they don't um, necessarily compete with each other um, so yeah we have put resource into that and hopefully we will have a new person very shortly actually sort of doing that um, and then what's been happening sort of more widely as the organization is as the organization is growing is that there are more stewards um, with more and more examples and more um, experience and, and a lot to share amongst them. And so we're trying to kind of facilitate ways of doing that as well. But it's all kind of, yeah, it's, it's definitely going to happen in the future. It's all kind of quite new to us um, as, you know, we're sort of developing it as we grow kind of thing. But that's how we're tackling it anyway. Any, any suggestions, Emma? Um, yeah, do let us have them. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. Um, we've got one here um, from Pete that is specifically about costs. So what are the average costs per annum per hectare for the land lease? Who should, who'd like to answer that? Yeah, Maybe should I have a go? Because I'm yeah, really going to sort you. of bat that off. <laughs> I mean, in, in as much as we don't, we have probably not don't use that formula. Um, mm. But um, the average, so I can say that the average cost of, I mean, Oliver explained that we sell 150 year lease um, and we have a number of ways of people being able to purchase that. But on our rent to buy scheme, um, this is, I would say on an average, averaging a, a plot of maybe four and a half to five acres. Um, we, the initial first five years is an interest free payment. So there's a 20% deposit on the lease. Um, leases average around 110, 20,000 pounds at the moment. We do a calculation based on what it's cost us to make create the, the farms. Uh, and that's how we get to the price. But if we say an average price of 110,000, um, the deposit is 22,000. Um, and then the monthly payments in the first five years are around 450,000. And then in the following 20 years are about 600, 000, sorry, 440 pounds a month. Got slightly carried away there. Um, and then the, uh, the, the remaining 20 years is about 610 pounds a month. These are very ballpark figures, so forgive me. Um, and that would mean that in over 25 years that you, um, you know, the, 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 the farmer, the, small, the leaseholder had paid out right for the lease and then there would be no further charges um, apart from a management fee which is getting a bit more technical um, I hope that answered the question somebody else back me up thanks Sonia um, and if you need any more information you can always email us directly about um, the costs of um, of the land um, I, might, I might just I might just throw one extra thing in there which is that um, at Green and Reach in Devon which was our first site everybody uh, started with a rent to buy model so they paid a deposit and then they had a 20 year plan um, to to repay the rest of the the cost of the lease but actually during the five years of the temporary permission they all found um, well access to extra finance. So they paid off all or most of their outstanding amounts. They didn't have the monthly payments anymore. So that is that that kind of thing is obviously possible. And I guess the benefit, one of the benefits of working with ELC is because we're set up to actually help people. We're not trying to make life difficult. Uh, we're looking for ways to help people in their individual financial circumstances. So, so it's something to talk to us about. Um, it's not that we're a mortgage company who has got a standard interest rate and then won't take on 
um, you know, developing issues or changing circumstances or whatever, you know, we're here to to help. We obviously have to look after our own financial interests and survive as a as a business, as a social enterprise ourselves. So we can't undermine that. But that being said, we we look for ways to help people. Thanks, Ollie. Um, uh, and a question here that Oli, I think you could um, help answer, which is, would we support with the organic um, and or biodynamic certi certification of um, one of the small holdings? Yeah, that's totally that's totally possible. And some of our stewards are um, organically certified. Um, uh, that, well, they certainly were. I think one of them is going through a process of maybe ending that certification. But anyway, the principle is it's totally fine to have your own certification um, process. But that's obviously something that that you take on as a business, as a farm business, and then do your own um, costing, monitoring on uh, marketing, etc. But I mean, our own our own monitoring process is is a quite a broad spectrum one at the at the sort of first instance because it's looking across more than just organic principles and more than just biodynamic principles is trying to look broadly at the ecology broadly that there is a, a business a working business going on on the site and broadly at the sort of social integration of the farm business into the community so so it doesn't have a hundred pages of closely worked out um, principles like the soil association organic standards um but if if so it's sort of the broad spectrum if you like at the first instance and then it can become more detailed at a, at a later point but any other certification scheme um is fine for for people to be working with in addition thanks um we've got a question here that um is an interesting one actually this is from rita asking what would happen if one of our stewards had um, a long-term illness or when um, tenant stewards reach retirement age? So I suppose this is thinking about the, the long-term um, plans around our kind of land ownership model. Um, I'm going to throw that one out to Oliver in the first instance, but other colleagues do step in, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question, Rita. It's one that we do get from time to time, and of course, it's a it's an important one. So the first thing to say would be that it is um, acceptable, completely acceptable, for our, our stewards to retire to their to their farms um, at the point where they um, are, you know, wanting to wanting to kind of bequeath their farm to to to, to family members, to children, etc then there is a requirement for those children to continue to be farming the site. Um, but certainly, yes, you can retire to your farm um, at a point when, um, yeah, you're ready to do that. Um, you know, it is you know, to a certain extent de dependent on, uh, on, an, on a few different factors, but yeah, the, the simple answer to that question is yes. When it comes to illness, um, we, we are certainly sympathetic to that kind of a scenario. And I suppose one situation where that might be um, uh, an issue that we would have to, to think about is if someone became ill during that five year temporary planning phase before the permanent planning is, is, is granted. And if that were to happen, then I think the likelihood is that we would look to to, to postpone the um, permanent planning application until such a time as the um, uh, the steward was kind of ready to continue working on the farm, um, uh, which would mean potentially another five year uh, temporary planning application at that stage. And that would be true for uh, a situation where other factors um, potentially have impinged upon um, uh, stewards ability to um, to within the, the five year temporary planning phase to demonstrate that their business is, you know, is a going concern. Um, certainly acts of God like pandemics and, and other factors, you know, will have an impact on 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 market forces, of course, and um, potentially, um, yeah, that will mean that um, that five year period isn't quite long enough for um, a particular farm business. And um, we would uh, uh, you know, look at that on a case by case basis. Um, any other comments from um, other members of the team on that on that question? Well, I was just going to add, well, add, I mean, as a great answer, um, and 
just to, to add that our tenancies, our leases are based on a farm, they are farm business tenancies, so they have, you know, they, all the, the sort of um, the rights enshrined in those um, in law and they, uh, you know, obviously that's where the, the right to assign, etc. comes in. Um, and the only thing, uh, just to sort of make it really clear that, that they can be assigned, you can retire, but, but anybody taking on the lease has to comply with the, the management plan and the other um, you know, section 106 agreements, etc., that are in the lease. So that's just to bear that in mind. Thanks. Um, there, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm trying to <laughs> make sure that we can cover all of these. So this might just have a very quick answer. Um, but the question here from Addy is: Does ELC support rewilding land space with ecotourism, growing, learning? Um, it says SRT focus. I have to say, I don't know what SRT focus is, but I mean, some art, art focus. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Ollie, would you um, do you think you could answer that question for us? Um, I'll have a go. There's not I don't think there's a very there's not a yes or no answer to that, because um, obviously we want our farm businesses to be compatible and, and harmonious with nature and biodiversity um, and we want to be part of a sort of functioning and vibrant you know rural land-based community um, that being said our permissions are based around an agricultural permission so when we get permission from the local authority it's about a rural worker business that is tied to agriculture and and there has to be some agriculture going on and it can't be just um you know a superficial agriculture it can't be a window box or um you know a bathtub growing potatoes it needs to be actual agricultural land use now if that is going on and then there are additional tourism um art other activities you know and, and space for rewilding and nature you know all well and good and fine but it can't be in place of agricultural work so that's what's important to um, bear in mind here. And, uh, you know, because of the, the nature of planning policy and how it works in this country, that the agricultural business has to stand up on its own terms. It can't be, well, it would be very challenging to get permission for, you know, growing five acres of potatoes that you then gave away to a, um, a sort of a, a food scheme, a local community food scheme that didn't bring any income and then bring your income in from, from arts or you know a, a year sort of camped at the back of the site that, that i'm not saying it would be impossible but it would be very very challenging um and already the process is quite a challenging one so i wouldn't i wouldn't be overly um uh, optimistic about how we would get that through and but it is very much a case by case basis basically so i think if you were seriously interested in that you know exactly what you want to do then the thing to do would be to as Oliver said in the in the presentation part would be to you know get in touch explain what you want to do and then we could have a closer look at it because it's quite difficult to give a generic answer to that kind of thing. Thanks. Um, uh, there's a question around how much the monthly rent would be from Ella. Should I pass that to Sonia? I think I said that I think that's what I was trying to say earlier when I said 440,000 pounds and you got that wrong. Um, so the monthly rent, it's completely dependent on how the lease is set up and paid for. And as Ollie said, you know, in, in some of our um, of our stewards have already helped us pay the, you know, been able to pay off the, the full amount of the lease premium. And so they don't have any rent. But go, if you if you follow, if you actually take up our rent to buy scheme with a 20 percent deposit, then the monthly rent is 450 pounds. For the first five years and a 620 pounds for the last 20 years and then you would have paid off your lease and that, as i said before those are ballpark figures because it will depend on the arrangement that's made um, at the time of signing the lease and also the price of the of the plot which is not fixed so but to, to give a, a rough idea that's what it is um a question about uh planning um, have we achieved planning for businesses that are only mixed horticulture? Um, yeah. Sonia. Yes, is the answer to that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a nice quick, quick answer. <laughs> um, this one is, an ex uh, is about um, urban sites. 
Um, so is there a chance of you starting urban sites in the future, perhaps as ELC grows its resource base, or are there those areas not being looked at due to high cost issues, visual amenity risk, et cetera? So really, I suppose that's a question about the location of our site. So maybe Stella, um, you'd like to step in on that? Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, sort of nail on the head there. An urban site would be probably cost prohibitive um, because there would be expected development on it. So that would probably put us out of the running to buy outright. Um, but donations, as I keep mentioning, are always welcome. And there's nothing to say we would not consider a, a, an urban site. Perry urban sites also very appealing and probably more so in many ways um, for agriculture. Um, there would also probably some, be some sort of planning constraints um, that there, we probably would be able to get the stewards more affordable housing nearby. So whether we would still use the same ELC model of getting residential planning permission, probably that would have to be adapted as well. Um, but certainly we're very interested in regenerating degraded land um, and urban and peri-urban sites give a good um, opportunity to do so, I imagine, um, and customer base as well, volunteer base. Uh, I don't think it's out of the question, but it's certainly not um, in our current field of vision. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I might just chip in there and say that we have been, we, it is actually in, in our, uh, our sort of current mission to look at peri-urban sites and we have done that a little bit but as Stella says you know um, there's that they have different constraints in terms of like whether we think we could get residential permission for people or whether it's even necessary so it's a kind it's slightly a diversion from our model and we are focused on our core on, on our core model um, for now um, but I think it would, you know, it would depend on on what, you know, if something became available and if there was a real opportunity. And I think it would also require us partnering up with other organisations, which is how we've kind of done it in the past is and, and are currently working is that we would look at um, organisations working locally and, and maybe kind of work with them to facilitate them to get additional land, um, which is something that we, you know, we do in rural areas as well. So that would be a way of doing it. Um, and just oh go on, well, I just I was just going to add a, a sort of broad point about looking ahead because I, I guess taking quite um, uh, yeah taking a, a view sort of from the from the future that our model is based on the idea that once we've established a, a good few um, permissions based on the sort of the, the core model, if you like, we then have much more credibility with planning authorities and we can then adapt and develop a variation on that theme and so all sorts of things become possible once we have sort of proved that we're a serious organization i mean and i would say we are we are at that point and that's why we are um hopefully going to get the results to our three um sites that are in you know where we've put in a planning application you know this coming year we should have had them already uh, last year um but the, you know just about it's possible to say that they're going more quickly except the, the pandemic has sort of thrown everything into chaos in planning authorities um but i think it's i think it's fair to say that each each application has a good chance of being a bit quicker than the previous one because they can see an existing record and that's very much the model that will bring down the cost uh, because the process takes a shorter amount of time and it also uh, makes variations possible yeah and and just to talk to the visual amenity um point that the person posing the question asked and that is more referring to development in open countryside um, than an urban site. If anything, we would make it substantially more beautiful if we were to take one on and are very, very unlikely to put up a block of flats, um, which I think that would affect the visual immunity. I suppose it is, it's, it's the same. Um, we would still not want to negatively affect a person's visual immunity um, because it's hard enough to be a steward without your neighbors disliking you. Um, but uh, certainly that refers more to development in countryside. Um, that's what the bullet point is referring to, that we wouldn't want a site that we took on to be um, heavily overlooked, um, because obviously that's going to affect um, the neighbours' enjoyment of the countryside. Uh, I don't see that being a problem in a city or at the edge of a city. Thanks, Stella. Okay, so we've got... Um... 
coming to the end. I think we need, we've got about two, uh, two more questions to go. So um, we have a question here about um, whether, um, how big the demand is for stewards? Um, is your model held back by any particular particular elements which hold it back from a massive uptake? So I suppose, yeah, that's just, I would point that one to Oliver because that's kind of about numbers of, of stewards being uh, Okay, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so we receive um, a lot of inquiries um, and kind of they often come in waves at various times of the year. Um, it's not, um, it's a lot rarer for those inquiries once uh, to kind of to translate into actual applications. So we actually receive relatively few completed applications, um, partly because um, it's a quite a lengthy application form and uh, there's a requirement to submit a business plan as well so it's a you know it's a serious piece of work for people to make an application um and uh, i would say in answer to the second part of the question that there are a couple of of, of things which um stop our model from um being massive um Firstly, the, the length and complexity of the planning process, which, which Ollie mentioned, that certainly adds quite a lot of, um, um, yeah, you know, it creates a situation where it's, it's, it's just a very, very difficult process. And uh, occasionally we've experienced stewards that have been unable to, um, applicants have been unable to kind of wait for the entire length of the process because other opportunities have come up. And then to be fair, that's, a, that's all part and parcel of, of what we expect really with these lengthy application processes. Um, so the financial constraints of our rent to buy model, um, even though we are endeavoring to make our, our plots as affordable as, as, as we can, and we're striving to do that um, um, as much as we can, and something that we're really focused on making our, our, our plots even more affordable, um, there is still um, you know, a significant capital investment, which um, prohibits some people through no fault of their own from being able to make a, an application at this stage. Um, you know, we're looking at other alternative ways of, of financing um, people to, to, to get them onto the land. But at this stage, um, our rent to buy model is, is the main thing we're able to offer and uh, not everyone is able to access, um, access our offering. Um, uh, because of the yeah, the initial financial investment. Um, the final thing I'd say um, that limits us is the location of our sites and people's ability to move. So we have um, sites in the south of England and South Wales, and we receive a significant number of applications or inquiries from people who are in the Midlands or further north who are really keen to um, uh, it, to make an application and to move on to an ELC site and have the, the levels of experience necessary in order to do that, but are not in, not in a position to move um, from where they think they're currently living. There's a there's a, obviously a huge amount of energy which is required to set up a, a new small scale farm business, and some people um, are in a position to move across the country in order to do that, um, uh, and others are not in that position, and for that reason they they choose to not not to make an application. Um, yeah. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Just that Go for it. Yeah. Really full answer from Oliver. Um, I was going to say that um, one of the things that we've been doing recently is working with um, the Scottish Farmland Trust to um, to be to sort of build their capacity to kind of hopefully share our learnings and and and, and talk with them about how. Um, you know, they can um, build their capacity to do a similar thing to the ELC, although they have different parameters, which I won't go into now, but um, in Scotland. And I think we, we, we'll, and we're building a, um, out of that project, a toolkit for organisations that might want to set up kind of community, you know, community farm land trusts rather than community land trusts for which there are a lot of resources. So hopefully rather than the ELC, you know, becoming the national trust of, of small farms um you know we'll we will be able to share our learning and, and knowledge and, and and also sort of learn from other organizations that are wanting to do similar things but in other parts of the country and that's how we see us being able to um 
to increase the amount of land available for agroecology without having to actually grow the ELC to be the organization that holds all that land. And whilst we're really happy to be growing, we see how much, the, how big the need is. Um, and so we hope that lots of, you know, we'll be able to work with lots of um, people who want to get started doing something similar in their localities um, to increase the amount of land available. So I just wanted to add that in as a thing that we're doing. Thanks, Sonia. I've got one more question um, that hopefully can be answered very quickly from Richard um, asking about whether our growers have experienced any barriers to marketing their products if they haven't chosen to apply for organic certification. I'm going to ask um, Ollie that one, um, bearing in mind it's 1224. Um, well, the short answer is no. Brilliant. <laughs> There's a term, isn't there, better than organic? And I think um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a longer answer. Also. There's a longer answer about how what people say about their business, about whether they're selling into sort of local towns or very nearby. Um, but broadly speaking, I think the, the key is that there are you know there are farms that are welcoming of people sort of coming to visit and seeing what's going on, and so they don't need the certification in the same way because there's a closer link to the consumers and the buyers. Thank you. Um, that's great. Thanks to the team for answering all those questions. And thank you to all of you for posing great questions to us. I'm going to hand over to Dylan to wrap up the session. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Cathy, for running that. Um, if, if anyone has any more thoughts or would like to any more inf information or would like to express an interest in in starting on this application or has further questions then as we've mentioned before please do get in touch with oliver um oliver at ecologicalland.coop his his uh, email address is in the chat box at various points um and i i think that's probably we'll probably call it there we go thanks lucy that's perfect call it at 12 25 an early lunch um but thank you so much everyone for coming thank you to everyone for presenting um thank you to orfc for having us and um we hope you enjoy the rest of your conference um we'll probably i'm sure see you at various other zoom rooms uh over today and tomorrow